everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you had a lovely lunch. Um, you've got uh, me, Giselle, um, and Dulcie for the next uh, just under an hour um, to talk about what role the da that data science has in the social sector. Um, I am going to quickly introduce myself and data kind. Uh, I'm going to do it quickly because I, I suspect a, a lot of you know me and us already, uh, but I'd be remiss if I, I didn't make sure that um, you knew who you, you're talking to. Um, so, oh, that sounds, sounds very high and mighty, you know who you're talking to. Um, so I'm Giselle, I am uh, the Executive Director of Data Kind, um, and I have with me Dulcie. Dulcie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dulcie. I'm the Data Science Lead at Data Kind. We are 50% of the uh, staff team of the <laughs> um, we And we're going to do a bit of a, a dynamic duo uh, with you this afternoon. Um, some of the things we're going to go through are up on the screen. You will there, There's a theme of orange. I hope that's all right with everyone. We're data kind as if it's anything and is an orange organization. So <laughs> actually, I'm, I'm dressed for the, the role today. Um, we're going to be going through these four areas. So a very quick, what is data science? If you caught our talk on Monday, you will know uh, with uh, a great degree of confidence what data science is already. Uh, but just in case you didn't, we're going to do literally a minute um, on, on that. Um, how can it be applied to in the social sector? So this is really when you'll learn about data science, because this is when we're going to talk about um, real examples and applications. Uh, thirdly, how do we make sure it's responsible? You've heard a lot about responsible data use responsible tech over the course of this festival. This talk is going to be no exception. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of mental checklists we go through in our work. And lastly, tools and resources for problem framing and assessing capacity. So essentially that you could rephrase that as some immediate stuff to get started. Uh, we want to make we action oriented and make sure you go away with some um, ideas about what to do next in your organization. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about, but who are we? Um, DataKind is a charity that builds data science capacity in social change organisations, whether charities, public sector bodies, social enterprises. Um, we do it through a large network of pro bono data scientists who work in industry and then donate their time to us and the charities and uh, other social change organisations we partner with. Um, and we've got some super light touch support so you can get an hour's worth of chat with a data scientist to unblock you if you need that um or you can get a year-long deployment project with us if you want to make um for example predictive modeling a part of your day-to-day -day organizational work um so everything in between um is is data kind and what we do um, i'm going to tell you a bit more about us at the very end of this presentation but for now we we don't want to dwell too much um, on that. We really want to get stuck into some of the learnings for today. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Dulcie to talk to you about data science and some applications of it. Yes. So um, what is data science? As Giselle said, we're not going to go into excruciating detail. We've done that once um, this week already. Um, but if you if you missed that session, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, one common definition that we like is that data science is the use of analytical and computational techniques to extract meaning or insights from novel data sources. And that this is usually for the sake of supporting an organizational decision. And alongside these kind of analytical and computational skills, of course, data science really needs the domain knowledge of the context in which the data was acquired so that these decisions can actually be strategically relevant and appropriate for the organization. Um, and as others have highlighted earlier, um, uh, Rachel mentioned this in, in the keynote this morning, data science um, and machine learning are very prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives already. Um, perhaps last night, Netflix or Amazon recommended your uh, evening viewing to you. Um, Tesco and Sainsbury's and all of the big delivery companies are, are busy using data science to optimize their route delivery so that they can successfully sort of feed the nation. Um, Gmail will um, and other email clients will classify your an email as spam or not spam. And then um, for those of you using a smartphone um, or one of those special house 
creepy devices, <laughs> I don't have one, um, Siri or Google Assistant, um, they use machine learning um, techniques to recognize your speech, recognize what you're saying, translate that to text, and then present you with like the what it thinks are the most useful um, search results. So it is fair to say everywhere. Um, but more importantly, how can it be applied within the social sector and within social change organizations? Um, we talked a little bit about this on Monday, but today we're going to talk about four questions that data science is really suited to um, address. And this is data science ra ranging from kind of descriptive analytics that you might be used to um, up to um, more complex predictive modeling. So data science can be uh, really um, useful for understanding who are beneficiaries and maybe for you beneficiaries are your 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 clients, your your donors, your grantees, um, and, and who's missing from that data set. Um, it can be used to understand how people are interacting with your services um, or, or using them. They're, you can think of this maybe as a customer journey. Um, and then, of course, to understand what the impact of your services are. Are your programs working? Who are they working for? Uh, lastly, data science can be useful for um, helping organizations understand where the greatest, most pressing needs are and um, potentially helping them identify those sooner um, than they might be able to do otherwise. So in terms of um, looking at beneficiaries, I wanted to highlight um, a project by an organization called Shout 85258. They are um, an organization who started really recently in May 2019, and they provide a free confidential um, text messaging support service for um, anyone who's struggling to cope um, so with mental health support. And since, I mean, yeah, a year and two years now, um, They've had more than half a million conversations with people, um, apparently, who um, reach out to them with uh, anxiety, stress, um, potentially suicidal um, thoughts, and really need immediate support. Um, they have recently released a report to understand who their users are. I'll put that link in the, um, in the chat as well. Um, and to trying to understand who um, who they're having these conversations with within these half million text conversations that they've had, and they found that the that actually children and young people form the majority of their texters. Um, Sixty five percent of their users were under the age of twenty five, and actually seven percent were age thirteen and under. Um, this is perhaps not surprising because um, you're getting digitally savvy users um, who've grown up with this kind of technology. But they also investigated a little bit around like what the, the main issues were that users were facing, um, which are shown here. Um, this is kind of aggregated, but the, the report dives into a bit more depth, like what types of issues uh, young people were facing versus older users. Um, for example, the younger demographic tend to um, raise concerns around self-harm and bullying much more commonly than the older users who were um, talking about the challenges of the pandemic itself and um, isolation. And I'll just put the link to the full report um, there. So if that's how a uh, sort of a quick snippet of how you might be able to use data uh, analysis to understand your beneficiaries, uh, how could it be used to understand how people interact with your organization? So for this, um, I'm gonna talk about a project that we actually did with Bottle UK. Um, they are an organization who provide advice and grants um, to children and, and families. And one of the ways that they do this is that they get calls or messages with, with with requests for advice and guidance, which they can then tag with the topic that that guidance is related to, say mental health or domestic violence. Um, and they had a bit of a hunch that, um, you know, if, if one of their uh, users was calling about a certain topic, then three months down the line, they, they would be calling back a, a, about a second topic, um, a distinct topic. So they wanted to understand how requests for help were connected. So, um, 
again, fortunately, they had tagged these uh, calls with the key issue that the caller was um, calling about, and so they could look at common sequences of calls. Uh, this is a definitely a complicated figure. Do not be overwhelmed. I'll, I'll walk us through it. Um, basically, what this uh, image is showing us, um, the size of the circles is showing the number of, of requests. So a bigger circle means that Bottle was getting more of the, these kinds of requests. And then the arrow um, indicates the common order. So uh, what they found was that when um, somebody called in initially asking about their child's health, for example, down the line, they would often call in with uh, concerns about their own mental health issues. And then from there, often with the questions around domestic abuse. Um, similarly, if somebody initially called in with some concerns around domestic abuse, um, that could lead down the line to um, uh, future calls around homelessness or estrangement. And so it told Bottle that there are indeed patterns um, in, the, in their user journey and that helped them provide more support in advance. So thirdly, um, how can we use data science to evaluate the impact of our services? This might be looking at um, whether your program is um, successfully achieving the outcomes that you uh, want it to achieve, or um, if it's working for a subpopulation of your, of your users and not for others. But for this, I'm going to talk about a project um, that the Chicago Alliance to End Homelessness did with um, a program out of Chicago, actually, called the Data Science for Social Good program, which has since expanded to the UK as well. Um, so the Chicago Alliance to End Homelessness is a consortium of organizations in Chicago. Uh, they provide various services to end, to end homelessness. Um, and they wanted to understand the efficacy of different housing programs. So which um, housing interventions or housing support programs were most likely to result in the client having some sort of um, more stable housing. And so as part of this project, they looked at the outcomes of users um, from who were either provided with permanent supportive housing, short-term or transitional housing, or were housed in emergency shelters. And they then looked at um, who amongst those users ended up in stable housing, so in a, a permanent home uh, versus unstable housing. Again, this isn't necessarily um, surprising, but I think the, this is called a Sankey diagram really shows the nicely the, the flow of client journeys, um, they found that people who were housed through this, the permanent housing program were um, had a very high rate of housing stability. So most of those people ended up stably housed. If you look at the folks who were offered short-term transitional housing, it's, if I had to ballpark it, it's around 50, 60% and aided, uh, ended up um, stably housed, whereas um, an, the other uh, 40, 50 percent were unstably housed. So there was a real split there in terms of people's outcomes. And so in the future, they want to use this to to try to understand the factors that are contributing to um, this. Some of the short term housing clients ending up in stable versus unstable um, uh, housing. Uh, so lastly, data science can be really powerful for helping organizations um, identify the greatest need, um, or perhaps pre predict need in advance and augment human decision making. So for, uh, for this story, I want to talk about um, a project that we did with the Welcome Center, who are a uh, small food bank up in Huddersfield, New Yorkshire. And um, they provide food parcels to their clients, um, but they also provide additional support through a triage support worker where they can. And they noticed that uh, some of their clients were coming in uh, only a few times. The majority of their clients were coming in, you know, one, two, three times for a food parcel. But uh, a minority of the users were coming in lots, 19, 20, upwards of that times. Um, and they wanted to identify who was at risk of this, this dependency earlier so that they could provide them some um, additional support earlier in their journey. So um, what we did with them was we, we worked with them to develop a model um, that based on the, the client's details would predict uh, their, their future usage. So for each client was um, uh, assigned or 
we generated a risk score or risk of dependency score that would flag to the support workers um, whether they were at risk of dependency. And if so, they could be uh, triaged and referred to um, a support worker for additional help. And um, of course, we don't know if this is causal, but this, this um, graph is showing us uh, the impact of, of, the, of the model on client dependency. So the vertical axis is looking at the average referrals per client over time. So back in 2015, just about, uh, just over two, 2.2 referrals per client. Um, and you can see that increasing over time. In 2018, this model was rolled out and we begin to see a flattening of that average referral number. So the average referral per client is stabilizing, indicating that perhaps um, uh, clients are able to get the support earlier and therefore they're not getting dependent on the uh, food parcel services provided by the Welcome Center. So this um, definitely raised a lot of kind of ethical challenges. And so I'm going to pass this back to Giselle, who's going to talk about um, how the Welcome Center and how in general we can think about making um, data science, uh, making sure that data science is done and used responsibly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I realized, uh, Dulcie, that was before in the plan of you having the slides is that I've, I've animated the next slide and it's got about 15 so um i think my um my starting premise here is that we all want to do um we all want to do good i guess then the hint is in the name of this this festival that we're all at we all want to do good with data and in, intent matters it's um it's incredibly important that that's our starting point um but I suppose our, our intent isn't everything. Um, if we've seen, if we've learned anything from some of the um, examples of what kind of non-good uh, data use, or private, some, some of the less positive examples of private sector data use, it's that um, intent evolves over time, and sometimes you move so far away from your intent that actually you you, you can't really uh recognize the um the impact of your your data project over time so so holding tight on that intent but uh, it, it is is really important but keeping in mind that the what ifs the but what happens in the case that x becomes y that those hypotheticals are really important to consider and um, so you can recognize when you're straying into them so you can do uh, your utmost to avoid them so you can mitigate against them so that's I'm going to talk about some of those those what ifs um but even if you you know if you stop listening now and you just decide actually it's time time for a tea then I'd, I'd want the message you took away to be ask what if consider all the the worst things that could possibly happen with your data project consider them ask those things ideally ask them out loud with your colleagues ideally ask them and have those conversations out loud with your um, beneficiaries and wider communities as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few examples here of, of some of those what ifs and I've got you'll see a, a list pop up and on the left hand side in blue I've got a kind of good thing um, and then if um, Dulcie click again you'll see on the right hand side pop up a list of, of um, red things which are the bad things so and I'll, I'm, I've got how many have I got kind of sees six of these pairs and I'm going to go through one by one um, and these these are kind of the, the flip sides of of the of the same approach i suppose so you might think as in the case of the welcome center food bank that we just very quickly went over um that it's a great idea to use a model for example to help you prioritize so can we understand who from from the the from what we know about them and from what they tell us the first time that person walks in or logs into our our service and and seeks our support can we know if they are going to have dire need if they need to be prioritized but for finding food for queue given more um uh, given more support that's that's efficient that's also probably going to decrease the kind of sum of human pain and, and distress um so that that seems like a great thing and um i'd love to see more social sector organizations do that the flip side of that is that you could take that same model and say okay well let's just let's ration our services to to um 
the a kind of a subset of those individuals so essentially you could use it to rather than ensuring that those most in need get support you could use it to restrict the support available um, to your, your client groups and that you could use the same the same data science could be reused in, in both those different ways um, so and the next line I'm gonna and then the red one as well um, so this is a um, a data collection example so you could collect your data to make use of it um, that's great as we, we heard from um, for those who were here for Rachel Caldercott's um, talk at 9 30 this morning uh, they recommended that you are lean in what you collect um, so you collect what you know you need now and that's really a very different perspective from a lot of traditional kind of data companies um, for you know Facebook are not collecting what they need to use right now they are be damn well sure they are collecting every little thing uh, every bit of exhaust every um, every every uh, movement um, perhaps we should be different perhaps we should you know c collect what we know we need to use rather than be very greedy and, and kind of eat everything up um, the flip side of collecting what we need and being thoughtful about that is collecting too much being invasive and potentially saying that onto third parties as well um, I'm, and, and this is I think this is a tricky area and I'm not please don't take from me that I'm passing judgment that you should never engage with other people um, who might be interested in your data but I think you've got to be super cautious um, about how you engage with other organizations and as social sector organizations do get more data savvy and we see lots more kind of collection and use of data I'm sure we will naturally look around us and go well we can become kind of we, we can we can use this as a an income stream you know we can become more diverse in how we um, seek funds by by selling on this um, really important really insightful data we have um and so i'd say that's it, it's an area that needs to be applied a lot, a lot of caution applied there a lot of thought applied um and in particular legally but you know, i'm talking about ethics here rather than the law uh, but I'd, I'd say we'll, we'll assume you're being lawful um that doesn't mean you're necessarily being responsible so um you know consider that carefully talk ideally to their beneficiaries as well so um well, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment and um, our third line um we have uh the good better target support the bad targets the easiest to help um so in an example where we use um a data science technique to for example understand which group is most likely to get a positive outcome from our work and which group is most likely to get a negative outcome we could use that information to say hey we should probably think twice about the nature of our programs for that group that's getting a poor outcome we should think about how we can do a, a, a better or different job of um, supporting that group because at the moment a small proportion for example of, of, um, of them get a good outcome instead we could say hey you know if we only take uh, people who um, uh, are female and under 25 and live north of the city if we only take them into our work, we are going to get 100% positive outcomes. And you know what a funder likes? A funder likes 100% positive outcomes. So it's, it's it, it, and that's the same approach. So we've, either way, we've kind of, we've segmented, we've said, let's look at the different groups and how they do on our programs. But in one scenario, we've done it because we want to learn how to better support people across those groups or better respond to people across those groups. In the other scenario, we're saying, actually, let's cherry pick. And uh, and get those those outcome figures up. So so flip sides of the same thing. There. Um, our next line: um, aid decisions versus fully automate. So um, one uh, one of, I think really crucial bit to all this data stuff, um, which from from the all the talks I've I've heard so far, I, I, I suspect we all know because it's, it's come out so much, but it, it's that this data stuff is a part of decision-making. It is not the be all and end all. Um, so we use it to aid decisions. Um, we use it to help inform our conclusions, not to solely drive our conclusions. Um, loads of other things might come into play. Um, I think that's that's great. That's built, put, uh, building on a, a bunch of different evidence and um, a bunch of different inputs to, to make a decision. What we can see creep in 
with data science work is that it becomes fully automated, i.e. we didn't, we used to use that model to understand um, what we should, uh, uh, what we sh what kind of support we should uh, uh, kind of match with a particular person, a particular beneficiary coming in the door. Um, now, we, we don't even intervene. We just, the computer says program A for person A, program B for person B, and then we just go with it. Um, that um you know if, if you're in a particular industry that might be fine i think in our in our industry that can become uh that can become quite dangerous if we if we do what they call take the human out of the loop um it's legally also tricky there's the law applies differently to systems that are fully automated versus partially automated or use um as an input uh, a model um, or other bits of data science. So kind of loads, loads of caution there. And that's this is an area where I'd say understanding what people are doing with the data science that you're using in your organization is really crucial because you could create a system that is um, that has a human in the loop, but actually over time that ce ceases to happen, but that you, you can't tell because the system is being interacted with in the same way. So I'd say that's you know really underlying the need to... Um, Keep having conversations with your staff and volunteers users about the role of, of all this stuff um next line penultimate line explain it versus hide it so um i think the i, I know from a lot of the organizations i interact with that the there's an impulse um sometimes to not be too loud about using in particular data science, but a lot of different data techniques actually, um, all different data science, um, because it's got a bad rep. Um, and I understand where the impulse is coming from, but I'd I'd actually, I'd, I'd say, do try and push, push to that left-hand side, push to explaining it. Um, if you feel like your community, your, your user group or your beneficiaries wouldn't be happy with what you're doing, that seems to me a pretty strong argument to question whether you should be doing it at all. Um, so it, it, in it, 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 you know, it's the kind of sunshine is the best disinfectant bit. Like if you, if you're uncomfortable explaining it, it, there's, you know, go with that, go with that instinct that there's probably something behind that. Um, so yeah, be, be as transparent as you can. Um, and um, I'd say there's, yeah, sometimes you hear, people say well it's complicated and it's, it's hard to explain uh, we've seen a, so much content during this festival even just during this festival let alone all the other things you encounter in, in life in your job about communicating data and um, it's yes it's a challenge but it's not impossible um so i'd, I'd say it could definitely be done and then the last line um increase equity versus reinforce bias um this is a big one so we know from um, uh, uh, the news um, <laughs> that there can be a lot of reinforcing bias um, in models. Um, simply put, mod thing when you model things, you use data to teach the model um, how to behave, and data comes from humans, and humans carry around a lot of bias. Um, so machines do too. Uh, so using models without um, interrogating where how they've how they've learnt um can really get you into a worse place than um than if you didn't have the model if you are interested in this kind of concept i'd recommend um coded bias which documentary came out uh, maybe a month ago or so now um which is absolutely uh, just a very captivating and um insightful watch um it's on netflix um for uh better or for worse, um, as a, the user of data science themselves. Um, but we, we do have an option to instead um, increase equity. So do things like um, test your models for bias, uh, test your systems also, like how's, how, how are people interacting? How does the nature of the, the, the process you're creating change interaction? Um, what's happening down the line? So what does your, your community look like six months after introducing something versus six months before you introduced it um and are some of those changes related to some of the, the kind of 
the, the way data is informing decisions and informing interactions and processes um, around your community, um, which uh, kind of leads me to uh, probably my last point on all of this, which is around evaluation. So um, if you do use data science and it's and you've and you've done all these things and it's amazing and you're you're sure it's having a very positive impact that conclusion holds as long as it takes you to say those words out loud um data science ages badly um because it because because of that teaching point so when you're a da like a, a use of data science will always be a um reflective of the data that was its input so it's essentially a snapshot of time so keep keep looking keep undoing and redoing and uh evaluating the impact of the accuracy of etc the um uh the, the things you're making um, so that that's my that's my bit around um responsible data use um uh, right now sue chadwick of the odi is also doing a session on ethics so i'd say uh, in a week's time when you get the link delivered to your inbox Click that one and, and have a look because I'm sure there'll be lots of great nuggets there as well. Um, before we move on to our next section, I did want to just talk about two resources um, that are really useful um, from our perspective on thinking about some of this stuff. Um, so Sense About Science um, have this uh, publication, Data Science, A Guide for Society, um, which is worth a read if you're looking at doing a data science project, um, but to um, boil down some of their points. Um, they've, they've got these three big questions that you should ask yourself. So where does the data come from? What assumptions are being made? Can it bear the weight being put on it? And I've, I love that third one because, yeah, sometimes the, you know, the headlines that come out of a survey of 16 people um, are uh, you know, a bit worrying. So can it bear the weight being put on it? Um, and asking yourself those three simple questions, I think will get you quite far. Similarly, um, for the next slide, we have another set of, of kind of good, simple questions. Well, simple to ask, perhaps not simple to answer. This is um, the, the, now, the now gone uh, dot everyone created this consequence scanning um, resource. Um, so going back to that kind of that what if, asking yourself, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, they've they've got a bit more structure here to the to that question. So firstly, what are the intended and unintended consequences of this product or feature? Secondly, what are the positive consequences we want to focus on? And thirdly, what are the consequences we might want to mitigate? Um, so again, a really good set of questions as you go about this um, this journey. Um, so that and if you sorry that that was where I was going to end. I'm actually just going to add one cheeky PS, which is um, at DataKind we have a bunch of uh, very project specific resources that we use to um, help our charity partners think about responsible data use. Um, we've got loads of um, uh, ch checklists. Essentially, we find checklists are really um, useful, um, not because you just can kind of get away with sticking them, but because to, to tick something off, you have to have had a bunch of discussions and a bunch of kind of thoughtful interactions. So it's um, kind of kickstarts those those thoughtful conversations. Um, and if you think they would be useful to you um, because you're starting off or in the middle of a project, um, then we can send them to you for, for you to use um, in house as well. So just get in touch with us. Um, uh, I'll stick our emails in after after I've spoken. Um, if you're interested in um, in those resources, okay. Elsie, I think I'm going to hand back to you to hear about uh, problem framing and assessing capacity. Yes, um, so that's great. Um, so we wanted to give you some a bit of a practical toolkit uh, alongside the kind of ethical framework for, for thinking through um, you know, should and how should you do your, your data science project. Um, we wanted to talk through some ways of thinking about is my problem data scienceable, the official term. Um, so uh, for that, I, I mentioned this um, 
on Monday, but um, I think this is a really useful framework by Eddie Copeland, um, who was formerly at Nesta. Um, and he has this four step approach to uh, data projects and, and thinking about whether you can answer this question with data. Um, it's iterative, so um, you can go round and round the circle, refining as you go. Um, but most importantly, I think it starts with the, the specific problem. So what specific um, actionable problem would you like to solve or answer? Um, we'll go through this in a bit more depth. Um, if you had an answer to that question, what would you do differently? What what would you do if you had different or better information? Uh, and then you can start to think about what you would need to see in order for you to actually take that action. And only then do you start to think about, do you have the data to do this, um, uh, to make that data product? So in terms of um, a specific problem, uh, what, is a, what is a good problem? What is a specific problem? Um, I think it should answer, be specific in terms of um, not just saying, for example, who are our users, that's a bit vague, asking something specific that might be which of our clients are likely to drop out of our program within three months or six months. It should be actionable. So if we knew X, it would enable us to do Y. And this will tie into the kind of overall mission of your organization. Often these problems um, will identify a gap. Um, one way that we um, try to start conversations when, when we're working with partners is to ask um, what information, if only you knew it, would make your job that much easier. Um, or uh, if we, we say, we don't know X, therefore we can't, we can't do Y. Um, and often these specific problems reflect a hunch that you might have. So an example might be that, you know, your problem is that we can't predict who is likely to um, complete our training program and who's likely to drop out. So we don't know who to provide um, additional support to. That could be an example. In terms of a defined action, um, Importantly, this defined action needs to be within your control. So, for example, you can't provide jobs for all unemployed youth in the UK. I don't think, <laughs> but you can certainly address an aspect. And so uh, the defined action should specify who will act when and how. Um, to, alongside the example of not being able to predict who is likely to complete your, your program, if we knew who is at risk of dropping out at the one month point, then our support manager would contact them for additional support. And so only after you've, you've thought about this specific problem of defined action does it make sense to think about the data product and the available data. Um, so what, what do you need to see on the screen? What information do you need summarized? What information do you need to make a decision? Um, and then do you have that data uh, to create the data product or answer that question? Um, or if you don't have it, can you get it legally and ethically? <laughs> um, there's a lot of open data uh, sources out there that are really helpful. The other question that you can ask yourself as well is, um, is data science the answer? Um, <laughs> you might think that with the title, job title, data science lead, I would say that the answer is always yes, but um, sometimes it, it isn't. Sometimes um, you might need something else um, in your organization. So some of you may have heard the talk from CN yesterday from Data Orchard around the data maturity framework. Um, and we find that it's a useful tool for thinking about um, your, the capacity of your organization to do uh, data work and take on these data projects. So this framework, looks at um, how organizations are using data. So um, whether they're using it to understand their beneficiaries for tracking outcomes, um, for recording activity, the, the quality and um, sources of data assets, the types of analyses that are used, whether you're doing more descriptive um, analysis or, or predictive analysis, um, but then also really importantly, um, the leadership and culture of the organization. So um, is the leadership bought into the idea of using data to inform decision making. Um, culture within the organization, is data shared? Um, do people have access to the, the data sets that they need? Does the team talk about data when they're um, thinking about the organization strategy? And then um, also questions around tools and skills. So who do you have in the organization with uh, an interest um, or a skill set that could maybe do some of this work? And so it might be the case that uh, doing a data science project is the right 
uh, step for you, but it might be that the best step you can do is to try to um, get more leadership buy-in or um, uh, improve some skills gaps. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out this uh, framework if it's new to you. So uh, conscious of time, I'm just going to pass back to Giselle um, to close us out and tell you a little bit about um, practically how uh, we tend to work with organizations and, and the type of support we, we offer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually, that was the plan. I'm actually not going to do that just because we have Great. so little time. Um, I'm instead going to say uh, we offer loads of support. Um, come speak to us. There's a, uh, we've got a booth and there's a little request info button. So if you press that, we will get back to you um, or just email us. I've, I've dumped your emails in the chat. Uh, we'd love to support your organization. Um, so at this, I'd love to just go into the Q&A and they'll see if you can stop sharing the screen and we can D orange everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to go in for the for our first question. Um, if you have more, please do dump them in. Uh, we'd love to hear them. So um, Anonymous says, Prioritize versus ration. How do we, as non-leadership, take steps to ensure our work is used in an ethical way? Any advice for driving this at a frontline level? That's such a good question. Um, Dulcie, before I <laughs> bow into this, um, any, anything from you? Um, you're welcome to plow into this. I think it's, it's tricky and I think it depends a little bit on, you know, the culture of your organization and how, how, comfortable you feel um, raising concerns um, I think if you are able to be transparent as a frontline um, provider with your users or um, clients with how the the prioritization or, or rationing is done I would definitely encourage you to do that but I know that sometimes you know this involves conversations with leadership that that may be more or less tricky Giselle what are your thoughts on this Mm. I mean, there's kind of fight data with data. Um, I, the, it, it what one thing you could do is to make sure that that those decisions, prioritization versus rationing decisions, um, are being presented back. So to essentially say, I've clocked, I've clocked this, um, and I have this metric which indicates the diversity of our community based on facet A, facet B, um, and and kind of monitor that and, and highlight that as it if if it as it changes, um, so that um, that leadership, you know, know that it's not going unnoticed. Ideally if there is, you know, if this all goes hand so many pieces, but uh, if this does go hand in hand with kind of transparent use of data in the organization, that can that can really kind of um, be, be beneficial because that will be that that change will be out in the open um i'd say the, the the kind of other thing about um again this is it's so complicated but about kind of data informed um decision making is to to ensure it's not or to, it's very hard because because we're saying kind of how do we do this from a from a non-leadership way and and potentially what I'm about to say is something leadership would be about to do but nonetheless my, my suggestion is to, to to try for data not to be a thing that like you do at your desk that's separate from what other teams do but actually build up like data literacy data familiarity within those other teams so that there's that it's it's that they're kind of what you're doing supports knowledge throughout the organization rather than what what you're doing being like a one source of knowledge that goes like unilaterally um kind of in in different directions to to different teams so really i i find this um the, the some bits that um lindsay from street league if you caught that talk was saying um were um really hit home because it's essentially it's trying to kind of and actually citizens advice um in their talk earlier today it's like trying to push that information out into the organization um and, uh, and and I think if if you do that with kind of the right metrics, that can that can solve the problem. But um, I don't want to be too rose tinted in my response to this. I, I you know, I, I suspect leadership goes a certain way. I'm not you know, the nature of hierarchical organisations. I'm I, I don't know if it, if you can prevent it. I think add, adding in 
adding in these ethical considerations into your projects so that they get aired frequently and by as broad a constituency as possible and ideally bringing your users in as well will really help. Um, conscious of the time, I think there's um, a couple more. Let's go for um, with three votes. We've got Richard is another danger with data science that it largely assumes patterns identified in current data can continue to be applied in future. Yep, definitely. Um, Dulcie, shy. So I was thinking about this question. I don't know if it's actually the problem, like, I don't know if it's a problem with data science per se, because data science doesn't necessarily think anything about um, whether the patterns are true or not true. It will tell you, um, like, you can you can test whether the patterns in your old data continue to hold in your new data. So I think it's, again, just a problem with humans. Um, and so the problem is that humans don't, if humans assume that patterns um, that were previously identified tend to hold. And so you need to, you know, actively check that your your model is still um, performing well, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, oh, I was going to say we have one more question, one more for you, I guess, <laughs> which is what's the answer to your pro and con cons column uh, that you presented? Is it to simply be as accountable and transparent as possible? Great question. Um, I don't think there's one answer. I, I really liked the um, point made oh, by someone who was it? I was just in a talk. Um, oh, it was Rachel, actually. It was Rachel this morning. Um, kind of someone said, um, you know, how? Do, what's the point in the process? Uh, you know, is it, is it design? Is it user research, implementation, is it iteration? What's the point where you do some of this thinking about responsible data and tech use? Um, and her reply was, you know, it's not a point, it's a practice. Um, and I, I really, I, I like that. I think the, essentially the answer to my pro and cons list is to um, embed as deeply as you can the practice of responsible data use within your organization. Um, so, which you could boil down to being accountable and transparent as possible. I think there's, there's probably a few other um, uh, kind of pillars of it, um, but but essentially figure out what your, or, or, or mull on what your values are as an organization um, and then mirror them in your data use practices. Um, and then I'm sure with, with your values on, on um, um, as an organization, there are uh, like speed gates or checkpoints you have in, in general to make sure you are living by those values as an organization or uh, I, I guess optimistically, I, I hope that. Um, and I'd say do the same, do that same parallel process to make sure you are living by those values when you are doing data science um, uh, projects um, and, and, and come, come in early, make, make those that way of thinking um, you know, happen T, T minus five, not just two weeks or two years or two months um, down the line in, in the project. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so embed, be values uh, led and um, and make sure it's not an afterthought. So, um, okay, well, I am way over time. Uh, that, is, that is all my fault um, because uh, Delcy kept the time and I did not, I apologize. Um, we have some more ta talks starting in uh, now 10 minutes, sorry, your break is, was 15 minutes, it's now 10. Um, we have, um, oh, sorry, oh no, I'm reading it wrong. No, they're starting in one minute, not 10 minutes. Um, sorry, everyone. Um, you've got Data Journey at Working Families. Uh, you've got a case study from Instacare using um, output data. You've got um, uh, Christina Finlay on five top tips for charities to make better use of data without big budgets. Um, they're all starting imminently. I hope you have a wonderful time at those talks and I will see you later to wrap up. Bye. Thanks everyone.